online for our latest KET webinar tonight. We're really pleased to have Rob Palmer with us tonight. You'll see Rob's uh, with us twice tonight. You can see him, see him looking at you as, as well as having his computer laptop um, showing as well. There's not much we can do about that, I'm afraid, but we'll just wait a few moments whilst everyone comes uh, on stream. We've got people again from around the world and we give you a very warm uh, welcome from where, wherever you're coming from. Uh, you've got the chat button there at the bottom of your screens. We'd be delighted if you uh, introduce yourselves and uh, and ask questions. I'm going to try and uh, take note of all the questions and comments as you put them into the, the chat box tonight. And uh, at the end, once Rob has finished the presentation, we'll uh, I think Rob and I will cox and box the questions together. Um, Rob is uh, an old friend. He uh, He's helped me for many years, actually. Um, in my research, and when I've, whenever I've had a curly question, I've always sent a little note to Rob and he comes back trumps. And we're delighted to have him uh, here tonight talking about armor in Burma. It's going to be really exciting. He's done a huge amount of fabulous research. So great. We've got some really uh, some old friends coming on. Very nice to see you joining tonight. Uh, James and Steve Snelling, that's fabulous. And Ian and Dave Current, brilliant. Ivor, marvelous. Uh, you're all really going to enjoy. It's going to be a, a really splendid presentation tonight. Sylvia, over to you. And hello from me, everyone, and a big welcome to you all again. And thank you for joining us this evening for another of our Kahima Educational Trust webinars. Tonight, the subject is armoured warfare in the Burma campaign. It was the general belief early on in the Second World War that it was not possible to use armoured cars and tanks in Burma. But in fact, not only did they play an important role in aiding the British Indian Army to escape from Burma following the Japanese invasion in early 1942, but they continued to play a huge role in the entire campaign from 1944 onwards. Here tonight to take us through the detail is Robert Palmer, known to many of you, I'm sure, through his website, British Military History. He studied for an MA in British Second World War Studies, and with a particular interest in the campaigns in Burma and Northeast India, he has visited Kahima twice in the last decade. He was also a trustee of the Kahima Museum for many years. Joining Rob, as always, is Dr. Robert Lyman, who, as you all know, is a brilliant military historian and the author of many books, most recently, The War of Empires. If you haven't yet bought a copy, do not delay any further. There are plenty available on our online store. We're gonna try and take questions at the end, as Rob's already said. If we do run out of time, we will get a reply to you via email. And now, without any further ado, as they say, over to you, Rob. Thank you, Sylvia. And only a few uh, words for me tonight as I introduce Rob Palmer. Uh, many of you will know uh, of his work through his website. I um, am indebted to Rob for many years, over many years of support. Whenever I've had a, a difficult question about Burma, I'll send off an email to, to Rob and with, uh, with, uh, with very little delay, I get a fabulous response. And it's a real pleasure to have um, Rob with us tonight to talk about armor in Burma. As Sylvia suggested right at the start of the war, in fact, Many people, in particularly in the Indian Army, didn't think that Armour had a role to play in Burma, despite the very clear evidence of the retreat from Burma in 1942, in which Armour played a very significant uh, part in the re recovery of Burma, uh, Corps and the Burma Army. Well, I'm not going to take any more of your time tonight, but uh, suffice it to say, I'm delighted that Rob's with us tonight. I think you'll be really excited with what he's got to share with you. Uh, I'll now hand over to Rob, and at the end of the, the, the show tonight, if you um, have any questions, put them in the chat box, and we'll deal with them at the end. But that's all for me. Rob, over to you. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the introduction. I feel very humbled by that. Um, yes, uh, it's been a pleasure to have your acquaintance for many years, and that is Sylvia. And having had the pleasure and privilege of visiting Kohima on a couple of occasions, I cannot praise too highly the work that the Kohima Educational Trust undertakes in Nagaland. And I've seen it firsthand, and I just am very grateful to be a, a supporter of yours. Um, I presume that everybody can hear me okay? 
Yes. Yes, good, excellent. Um, then I will uh, start to take you through. As I said, I've called the uh, presentation where there is a will, there is a way. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, you should have a clue of why. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover. So inevitably, I perhaps can't go into too much detail um, of individual actions, but I'm trying to give you a flavor and an overview of the role of tanks and armored cars in the Burma campaigns, uh, both starting with the first Burma campaign in 1942, leading to the conclusion in 1945. There's a little bit of context to, to put into place um, about the development of the British Indian Army and armor. And then I look at the first, Seventh Armored Brigade and the first Burma campaign. Then I look at the Arakan, which is quite tragic and where things went wrong. And then the Battle of the Admin Box and where things started to turn around, and particularly the role of Frank Maservery, um, who was the general commanding the Seventh Indian Division at the time. Then Kohima, Imphal, and Namshigum. And apologies if I've not quite pronounced that correctly. Um, and then moving on to the 1944-45 campaign, including the spectacular uh, achievements at Mictilla, and then following with some conclusions. Some of you may recognize this. This is Num Shigum, uh, taken from the plane below, but I just started off as an indication of the type of terrain which the British and British Indian troops based in both Burma and Northeast India. I mean, obviously in front of us is nice and flat and you would imagine an ideal place for the deployment of armor. But you just look at the hills behind and actually most of the fighting took place in those type of hills, not in the plains below. Now, how the hell would you get a tank up there, let alone fight it? But that's what the uh, British and British Indian Army faced in the Second World War. And that's the situation they overcame. Now, just to do a little bit of context, and I don't mean to be controversial, but just to put it into context about why India came in, um, Japan annexed Korea as early as 1910, but during the First World War fought alongside the United Kingdom. And some sources suggest that the, the Japanese felt rather snubbed at the end of the First World War because they felt they should have been treated on in the same manner as the United States. Um, they'd been fighting a war with China since 1937. Uh, and as a result of this, the U US has supported China. Sanctions for oil uh, started to be imposed on the Japanese. They've got no natural resources themselves. So many people would suggest, and looking at the uh, documentary evidence, many people felt that war was sadly inevitable and it was all about resources. As early as the 6th of December, 1941, the invasion convoy was sighted off Malaya. And if you look at, because of the international dateline, actually Malaya was invaded six hours before Pearl Harbor, which leads to the question, was Pearl Harbor so much of a shock as some people believe it to be? Of course, there were British interests in the Far East, not only including Malaya, but Hong Kong and Burma. And then the United States um, had the control of the Philippines and the Dutch, the Netherlands, East Indies. <coughs> now, in terms of India, I would suggest that India at the time was effectively very similar to how Scotland is now. It was part of the United Kingdom. There was a Secretary of State for India that sat in the British cabinet. And a third of the British Army in 1939, in terms of uh, regiments, a third was based in India. That's what the commitment was. That's why India has such a major effect on British culture. Now, in terms of the Indian Army, there was 21 cavalry regiments into, grouped in, into three um, groups. Now, the only armor, the only tanks were with the Royal Tank Regiment companies, which were used in the northwest frontier. The others were still horsed regiments, 
um, which were used very much for ceremonial as well as for in internal security. Now, the role at the time of the Indian Army was to reinforce the Middle East. The Middle East, of course, is relatively flat, it's a good place for tanks, but there wasn't any real resources for the uh, Indian Army at that stage. Likewise, resources for Malaya, including Singapore and Burma, were very limited. Uh, Hong Kong, to some degree, was seen as expendable, very difficult to uh, defend. And the United Kingdom was struggling to maintain a war against three enemies. And certainly when you look at the attitude perhaps in Malaya, um, amongst some of the uh, uh, colonial uh, people there, there was a hope that if they buried their head in the sand, that it would actually pass them by. But as we all know, on the 22nd of December 41, the Japanese invaded uh, Burma. They crossed near Mormain. Um, the British forces, British Indian forces in Burma were weak. The 70th Indian Division actually only consisted of one brigade at the time. Um, the, and what happened was the brigades already there were augmented um, to it. That's because the other two brigades of the division had been sent to Malaya. You might have heard of the Battle of the Sitang Bridge, which effectively uh, led to the destruction of the 17th Indian Division. This left Lower Burma open. And at this stage, we introduced the 7th Armoured Brigade. Now they had been bound for um, Mal uh, Malaya. Um, they had left Egypt. There was only two regiments, the 7th Queen's Hussars and the 2nd Royal Tank Regiment. And they were equipped with Stuart tanks, which you'll see a picture of in a minute. But because of the crisis in Burma, they were diverted there um, and they arrived at Rangoon on the 21st of February. Now at this stage, Rangoon was effectively almost under siege. So within a day or two of landing, they had to get themselves together and move out to Prome in order to assist in lifting the siege. Um, again, without going into too much detail, the Japanese kind of came around on a hook and left a bit of a gap and the British managed to extract themselves through that gap. Now, for a period, the brigade was under the command of the Chinese. So they were working together. And eventually, following a long retreat, on the 31st of May, it reached India with just one tank. Now, this is a picture of a Stuart tank. They were light tanks, American made, fitted with a 30 milli 37 millimeter gun. Um, but uh, for what they were used for in Burma, they were quite effective because the Japanese didn't have many tanks or significant tanks themselves. So uh, the, the Stuart was quite uh, effective. This is another picture, which again gives a little idea of some of the conditions uh, and the size of the tank. It was quite small, it just had a crew of three, um, powered by a converted aero engine. This map gives an illustration of how far um, the brigade had to travel and how many engagements it fought in. So it landed in Rangoon, then it was deployed out to try to stem the Japanese advance, but then eventually you know, moved northwards, a distance of about 800 miles. And then famously, uh, they got to the river Chindwin. They only managed to get one tank across, which was then known as Scotland's Curse. And the rest of the tanks had to be destroyed um, you know, on the uh, Japanese side of the river Chinwin. <coughs> and that was the first deployment of armor in Burma or Northeast India. The next one was quite tragic. Uh, the British looked to advance down the, again, Mayu Peninsula, uh, apologies for the pronunciation, uh, a limited offensive down towards a cab which was the target really, where, where there was a, an airfield. And at this stage, you had three British regiments who'd been sent out to India. They had started to convert to armor in the UK, 
but they were sent out to India uh, where they started to uh, use tanks for the first time. Uh, and one of these regiments was the 146th Regiment of the Royal Armoured Corps, which was uh, converted from an infantry battalion of the Duke of Wellington's regiment. Now, a Captain de Costa was ordered with two troops to participate in the attack on a cab. Now, he and his two troop commanders, both lieutenants, had to walk 17 miles in order to undertake the reconnaissance for this attack um, uh, at a place called Dombike. Now, there were large numbers of Japanese bunkers here, which had completely frustrated the British attempt to try to uh, capture them. So the idea was for the two troops of tanks to work their way down, and again, you'll see a map in a minute, um, and then hopefully subjugate the Japanese bunkers and then go back down to the beach and extract themselves. Now, the attack started quite well. But then the lead troop of three tanks um, fell into a ditch. First one, then a the second one fell in on top of it, and then a third tank crashed into the ditch. Now, at this stage, the battlefield was covered in smoke and haze. Um, the other uh, Captain de Costa could hear the bees of the machine gun fire. And whilst he attempted a rescue, he was unable to actually get close to the tanks. Um, he eventually had to withdraw up the beach uh, with the sad realization that there was little that he could do for the nine members of crew. The other lieutenant, the other troop commander who survived, went back to the scene in 1945 with a graves registration unit and there were human remains uh, next to the tanks. The tanks were still intact, apart from the wireless being removed. There was even a shell in, in the breach, um, but only five of the deceased could be identified. So they're buried together in a communal grave at Taishan. This is a picture of the Valentine tank. Um, it was British. It was an infantry tank. It had a crew of three. Um, one of the main weaknesses was its speed. It was only 15 miles an hour. So it was quite slow. This slide gives uh, an idea of the nature of the countryside. You can see that Don Bike is down in the on the left hand side of this uh, slide, but it's down this peninsula, and you can see that the hills uh, form the spine of this peninsula, coming down to the Maya River. And then the other side of that is Rakab, Akab, and um, that's where the, the fighting was taking place. Oops. I thought there was another slide. Let me just see if I've gone too far. Oh. Then we move on to the Battle of the Admin Box. And here we start to introduce the role of Frank Maservery. Now, he is an interesting character in himself and is worthy of a lecture, but uh, he was an Indian Army officer. He was a cavalry officer. He had been, uh, he'd gone to the Western Desert in command of the 4th Indian Infantry Division. He was then swapped to command the British 1st Armoured Division. Um, things didn't go too well in the desert and he was sacked. He was sent back to India. And for a time, he was the director of armored fighting vehicles at headquarters, uh, India Command. Now, as such, he did a review, and his review was that he felt that uh, his outcome, his conclusion, was that tanks could be used in Northeast India and Burma. And uh, he was very much a proponent of that. He then effectively had the opportunity to put his money where his mouth is, because he was then given command of the 7th Indian Infantry Division. And they were advancing down the peninsula that we saw previously in the uh, Arakan. Uh, then the Japanese counterattacked. His division was cut off and surrounded, um, but they formed a series of boxes. 
and instead of retreating, they stood and fought. And this led to the fairly well-known Battle of the Admin Box. Now, the 25th Dragoons were core troops, which uh, were equipped with Lee tanks, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, and they were there in the admin box and they played a key role in keeping the Japanese at bay. And they would head out um, from the, the center where they were kept um, safe at night. And um, they would support a counterattack or stop a Japanese attack, then withdraw in at night. Um, as you can see, the battle lasted from the 5th to the 23rd of February, 1944. Um, but the tanks were the tanks were so effective that the Japanese attempted suicide attacks on them, uh, fortunately without any great success. This slide shows the location of the admin box. Um, as I said, if you remember that slide with the peninsula, it's a little bit further up the peninsula. The admin box is in the center, but you can see is in the middle of the Mayu range, um, where you've got the pass that goes through from one side across to the <coughs> Kalapanzin River. And uh, that's the area where these, this battle was fought. This is the only picture that I've managed to find of purportedly of the 25th Dragoons in the area. And this is your first site of the General Lee tank, which played such a crucial role in the uh, Burma campaign. We'll uh, have a closer look at the tank in due course. Now, moving on to Kohima. Again, this is an interesting story which uh, could almost form a, a lecture in itself. Um, there were no tanks at Kohima, there were no tanks at Dimapur. There was, however, an armored brigade at in fall. And one of the squadrons of the 150th Regiment of the Royal Armoured Corps was um, ordered to join the 3rd Caribbean Airs at um, Imphal. So the personnel were sent out by air. Of course, the tanks couldn't be taken by air, so they were brought by land. And they came up by train to Dimapur, and then the idea was to uh, take them down by the road to Imphal. But by the time they arrived at Dimapur, the road had been cut. So you've got the men at Imphal and the tanks at Dimapur. Now, what actually happened was that the men at uh, Imphal managed to borrow some spare tanks from the uh, Carabiniers, and they actually fought as a squadron with the third Carabiniers during the Imphal siege. But that left the tanks at Dimapur. Now, as it is situation at Kohima deteriorated, a Lieutenant Waite from the 150th Regiment scraped together some men, um, including from the Royal Artillery who could fire the guns, from the uh, from Rimi and the Indian uh, electric, electrical and mechanical engineers, and he managed to form crews for five tanks. And it was these that set off on the, 18th, the 11th of April to head up the road towards Kohima. Now, they, the idea was for them to help clear the road towards Jotsoma. Now, again, time doesn't permit me to go into too much detail, but basically they started supporting, particularly the Cameron Highlanders um, with their fire support. They, at one stage, got a bit lost and drove past a point and they, military policemen had to head off on a motorcycle to stop them, turn them around, which they could only do by maneuvering on the road, and then get them back to safety. Now, the other regiment which was deployed to Kohima was the 149th Regiment of Royal Armoured Corps, which had been formed by conversion of a battalion of the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry. And this is where one of our characters comes into play, because he B Squadron was commanded by Major Ezra Rhodes, uh, more of whom in a minute. Now he was asked to deploy his squadron up to Kohima, which he did. Um, 
the there were several attempts to get the tanks up onto the uh, uh, onto the ridge to support the troops, and uh, in particular, um, trying to get up to uh, the tennis courts and up to the uh, district commander's bungalow. Uh, this was a joint effort by the Royal Engineers and troops to actually build a road to actually get the tanks up there, which they, they did so quite effectively. Um, this is where on the 6th of May, the tank which was commanded by Major Rhodes slid off the ridge and slid down and landed at the bottom of the ridge, which is where it still is today. And it's a very famous focal point for anyone who visits Kohima. Now, on the 13th of May, um, Sergeant Waterhouse was one of two tanks up on top of Kohima, and he was asked to go and support the Dorsets in clearing the tennis court. And uh, he basically did that by the very simple um, method of getting his tank to the edge, driving it off the edge, dropping down literally onto the tennis court. Uh, in doing so, they crushed a Japanese bunker. And then he used the machine guns um, and the 75 millimeter gun to basically blast the rest of the bunkers into oblivion. And the Dorsets were extremely grateful. Two platoons came in, one from each side, and the tennis court was clear. You're all fairly familiar with Kohima and where it lies. Um, the reason I put this one up, obviously, is, is to show that the tanks actually had very limited range of maneuverability, mainly restricted to the road. Um, but obviously, to support the attack on the tennis courts and up onto the district commander's bungalow area, they had to build a track, which you'll see more of in a minute. Now, Rob Lyman has very kindly provided me with a couple of slides which I've included, which have been very useful. But uh, it just gives an idea of the tennis court. Um, and again, how do you get a tank up there to actually support the infantry? Well, this is how they did it. And that's the approximate line of the movement of the tank. Um, they got them, as I said, they built a track to get up there. They got in behind the club. And then that's where Sergeant Waterhouse basically drove his, his tank off the edge of a, not a cliff, but a, a fair little drop. And it dropped down onto the tennis courts where it started to become so effective. Now, just looking a little bit at uh, Ezra Rhodes, he was like so many of the men who fought at Kohima, he was not a career soldier. He was born in Sheffield. Um, he married in 1939, but I'm not clear whether he was called up or whether he volunteered, but he was sent to an officer cadet training unit and he was commissioned into the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry in June 1940. Now, when that battalion with which he was serving um, transferred to the Royal Armoured Corps, he transferred across to the Royal Armoured Corps as well on the 22nd of October. And by the time of Kohima, he was an acting major and the officer commanding B Squadron of the 149th Regiment. As I said, in one sense, he's uh, been immortalized because of where his tank landed up. Um, but he was just a very, by all accounts, very modest uh, man. He uh, was a very effective commander, by all accounts, very well respected. And he faced all the issues of trying to get his tanks up there and fighting them alongside the infantry, which he managed to um, resolve. Um, I mean, after the war, he joined the army for, um, full time um, and retired as a major. And then he died in Bristol in October 2003. The only picture I can find of him is him towards the latter stages of his life, where you've got this tall, distinguished gentleman sat in this garden looking quite uh, at peace. Unfortunately, I've not found any fo photographs of him actually uh, while serving at Kohima. And this is his tank. This is how it was when I first visited 
And I put this up to, I think, in my humble opinion, to demonstrate the effect of the Bohema Educational Trust and what the local people have achieved. Because this was the state of the tank when I first visited. And then a couple of years later, when I returned, it's all tidied up. There's a fence around. Um, it's all looking a lot smarter. And before I move on, you can see the slope to the left where the tank slid down. And of course, at the time in 1944, there were no trees there because the area had been blasted repeatedly by artillery. So that's why it was able to slide down the, uh, the hill as it is. The trees are obviously post-war. And this is the memorial at Kohima, which I'm sure many of you have seen, um, which mentions Ezra Rhodes. Um, and again, the, the issue to point out is that it was constructed by the Kohima Educational Trust. And it's brilliant because it provides that little bit of context to that tank. It provides the education uh, and information for visitors and uh, explains why you've got a generally M3 tank uh, sat where it is at Kohima. It wasn't just tanks deployed at Kohima. Um, there was a armored car regiment uh, known as Prince Albert Victor's own cavalry, the 11th Frontier Force. Um, quite an interesting regiment. It's the only regiment of the Indian Army to have fought the Japanese, the Italians, and the Germans, because it had served in the Western Desert, where it had been badly uh, knocked about, and then come back to India. Um, it had three squadrons, two were Sikh, sorry, one was Sikh, and two were Punjabi Muslim men. Those are Punjabi Muslims. Um, they all fought alongside and seemed to get on very well together. They used Daimler armored cars and some Humber armored cars as command vehicles. And just a little story I will mention here is about that gentleman, Lieutenant uh, Fauja Singh, again, apologies for pronunciation. He had been what's called a Rizaldar Major, so equivalent of the Sergeant Major, um, when he accepted a King's Commission. Now, this meant that despite the fact he was only a Lieutenant, he was a very experienced soldier, uh, a career soldier. Now, they, the regiment was asked to see if they could get uh, an armored car into Kohima to take some supplies in and to bring some wounded out. And Lieutenant Singh volunteered. Uh, the armored car actually reached the district commander's bungalow before it was hit um, and uh, disabled. And Lieutenant Singh uh, got out of the armored car. He was injured, uh, he was captured, and two days later he died. Um, the circumstances of his death are, are not known and perhaps are irrelevant, but he gave his life. Uh, sadly, his body was never found, so he's commemorated on the Rangoon Memorial. His driver, I think this is a lovely story, he got out, um, realizing what was going on, he stripped off his uniform, he picked up a road worker's basket, plonked it on his head, and calmly walked back to British lines. Now, if that's not initiative, I don't know what is. I've got a couple of bits of video here, which uh, will just demonstrate the tanks and their use. India's Minister of Information says, we have trapped the enemy in the Imphal area. He must either withdraw or be annihilated. These pictures from the Assam Burma border take us into the hills of Manipur where men of the 5th and 7th Indian Divisions are in action. The main fighting has so far occurred along the roads, where the Japanese have sprung out of the jungle in force at several key points and attempted to establish roadblocks to prevent us from concentrating our forces against him. Tanks, artillery and infantry are in process of knocking the enemy before he has time to become established.
Japanese held villages are consumed by flames as his attempt to seize our offensive base at Imphal is thwarted. <laughs> This is any man's country. Large opposing forces can wander for scores of miles without ever meeting each other. But when they meet, it becomes a massacre. Japanese corpses are strewn thickly where they fell after being caught in a merciless crossfire from infantry and tanks. They have no further interest in Tojo's gamble. For them, it has meant death in a strange jungle 3,000 miles from Tokyo. Just before we move on to this slide, um, I, I put that video in, firstly because it was available, but secondly to give you an idea of the General Lee tank. Um, I'll give you a little bit more information on it in a minute. But you can see that the key thing was it carried a large gun, a 75 millimeter gun in a sponson on the side of the tank with a 37 millimeter gun on top. And it also carried two machine guns. Therefore, it was very useful um, uh, to provide fire support for the, uh, for the infantry troops. The next situation that I look at, uh, we look at is, uh, we moved to Imphal, subject of that last uh, video uh, film. And here again, we mention the 3rd Caribbeanaires, a British army regiment who were based at Imphal, uh, again, equipped with the Lee tanks. Um, as I said previously, one squadron of the 150th Regiment had got to Imphal, but they didn't have their tanks, but they managed to find some. And uh, they fought alongside the 3rd Caribbeanaires. Now, there was a lot of actions they were involved in, again, too many to mention, um, but really the, the key one, which is probably well known, is the battle um, at Nunshigam, which takes us back to that uh, picture right at the very beginning. B Squadron of the Carabineers was supporting the 1st Battalion, the 17th Dogras, um, in clearing a hill where the Japanese again were entrenched and had dug plenty of bunkers. The hill was over a thousand feet above the plane, um, and two troops were used to go up the hill to support the dog roads. Now, the people you see below, Major Sanford and Lieutenants Neil and Herbert, um, these men were all either injured or killed because the problem was they had to put their heads out of the top of the turret to see where the tank was going and to actually command the tank. And the Japanese became quite good at, uh, if that's not an inappropriate term, but quite uh, uh, successful at sniping and killing the, uh, the tank commanders. This led to just one tank under command, and it was under the command of the squadron of Sergeant Major Craddock. And he, together with a subaldar from the, uh, sorry, subaldar from the uh, Dogras, because all the British officers have been killed or wounded, they led the final attack. Now, again, just uh, a couple of illustrations. The first one on the left hand side places where Numshigum is. It's to the north of Imphal, just off the Okul Road. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see how the, uh, the attack was carried out. So they basically came up from the south got onto the top and then drove along the ridge, clearing the bunkers. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, that's what it looks like. And if you can just imagine, um, that's from the, I'm trying to remember which way around it was. I think that's from the south looking north, I think. I might be the wrong way around. No, yes, I'm looking north, aren't I, to the twin bumps. Um, so, uh, yes. That's the type of ground that the tanks had to get up, and that's the type of ground where Sergeant Major, sorry, Squadron Sergeant Major Craddock took his tank. Um, that's just another bit further on. And again, you can just imagine what that's like. It would have been much more devoid of vegetation, 
but you can see what a uh, difficult terrain it is to get a large tank up there. The just going back before I mention this one is that the successor regiment of the Third Carabiners still parade once a year under the command of the Squadron Sergeant Major uh, in commemoration of the events of Numshikum. Uh, and it just shows that quite often in there's people criticize the senior non-commissioned officers of the British Army for lacking initiative. I would say that I've got lots and lots of examples where that's not the case. This is reputed to be, as the title suggests, the highest place that they managed to get a tank, which is a place called Kennedy Peak to the south um, near Tidim. Um, again, it's several thousand feet, but it varies a little bit depending which source you look at. But they managed to get a tank right up to the top here. Now, a couple of slides about the tank, and just to explain a little bit more detail, <clears throat> these tanks were American. They were obsolete uh, as far as um, the Western Europe were concerned, Northwest Europe and uh, Italy. Um, there were some, some used in Italy, but as command tanks by the 6th South African Armoured Division, but they were obsolete, except here in Burma. Now, without boring you too much, they were 18 feet 6 inches in length. They were 8 foot 10 inches wide. They were very high, being 9 feet high, and you can see that with the uh, picture there. And they weighed 27 tonnes, which many people had considered was too heavy for use in Burma, but Frank Maservery said that no, they could be used. These are two further shots of the tank. Um, as I said, it became really the main workhorse of the Burma campaign for the simple fact that Burma was still very low down the priority list for the Sherman tanks, which were generally going to Italy or to Northwest Europe. Now, in terms of armoured warfare, this was really the highlight, the masterstroke, which is when the uh, 14th Army made as if it was going to attack Mandalay. But actually, they secretly brought a division and the 255th Armoured Brigade down, crossed the Irrawaddy, and then struck out for the garrison town of Mictilla. Um, you can see the speed at which they advanced. Um, by the 2nd of March, the airfield was captured. Um, the Japanese were completely disorientated because it was one of their main focal points for the lines of communication. Uh, they attacked and attacked, but the British employed a form of very aggressive defense by use of armored columns. And these struck out and struck the Japanese and basically blunted any uh, counterattacks that they uh, launched. And by the 30th of March, the Japanese were defeated and the British could move on to Rangoon. Uh, this is a map from a book about the Battle of Mactilla. Um, You can see the lake, you can see the airfield just to the right of the town. But you can see just how the British basically were surrounded by Japanese, but used the tanks in particular uh, quite aggressively to um, push the, the Japanese back, um, which they did so very successfully. I've got another piece of film footage, hopefully. Army men go forward on the last stage of the drive which won back Mandalay. 42 actions in six weeks is the battle record of these tank and infantrymen. With Mandalay just round the corner, the Japs are being burned and benetted out of the way. Current opinion is that the fall of Mandalay spells finish for the Japs in Burma. But his country seat in the east goes west. Obstinate tree is flattened out, but not before he got a half Nelson on the tank. Among the victory souvenirs is a captured Japanese flag. Uh, 
There are other enemies to be fought, silent and deadly as the Japanese. Refugees, the universal trademark of wars the world over, stream back from the battle zone. front, jeeps may come and jeeps may go, but the mule goes on forever. British and Indian infantry head for Mandalay and beyond. War swirls angrily around the fellow beauty of old shrines and palaces, then passes on and leaves them serene again. the troops. Dancing girls in national costume put on a pui, the Burmese equivalent of an answer show. They're welcome to British and Indian liberators. There's a meaning somewhere behind this weird and wonderful dance routine. Make your own guess what it is. Again, one of the reasons I used that last video clip was that, first of all, it shows the tanks in action. Secondly, it shows that the tanks were deployed alongside infantry. There was actually uh, an infantry regiment, the 4th Bombay Grenadiers, who supplied troops to fight alongside the armoured regiments because the two had to work hand in hand. Um, if the tanks went on uh, unescorted by infantry, they could be attacked by the Japanese using uh, petrol bombs. Uh, and other uh, suicide attacks. And likewise, the infantry were completely uh, dependent upon the tanks to actually um, deal with uh, machine gun nests and, and things like this. Uh, this is a, a picture of Sherman tanks, uh, a few of which were deployed um, to Burma. And again, it's just lovely just seeing uh, the, <laughs> I gotta put it politely, the mess really, you know, when you see um, pictures of reenactment groups, everything looks so nice and clean. But you've got a couple of tanks of different varieties of vehicles. You've got all sorts of kit loaded on. You've got the troops loaded on. You've got motorcyclists. You've got a Jeep. Um, and it just is a very nice picture of how the uh, reality really was. I pose a question. You can provide the answer. But... Um, it's just a lovely juxtaposition of a, an ele elephant uh, alongside a, a Sherman tank. I've touched upon some of these issues, but the tanks weren't used as they were in Northwest Europe. Um, they weren't used in divisional or even brigade formations. They were used in small units and squadrons to support the infantry. And a bit like by the time in 1944 where armour was now being used in all arms groups in Northwest Europe. Uh, this was very much the uh, mode of uh, operandi in um, modus operandi in Burma. And they also had obviously the tactical air support as well. There was a role developed here called the forward tank officer. Now, if you go back to that last video, you can uh, realise how noisy the tanks were. Now, they had a telephone on the back of the tank, and a tank officer would actually be out on the ground with the uh, infantry, and he could use the telephone to direct the tanks towards particular bunkers. I mentioned previously the role of the 4th Bombay Grenadiers. Um, they were very closely involved with all the armoured regiments. Um, and the Japanese, basically, their countermeasures just did not prove to be effective. And, uh, you know, in the end, uh, the result was very much dependent upon individual bravery by soldiers, but Frank Mosservery was proved right. I'm just going to finish uh, off with just a little bit of a personal aspect, uh, which is quite important to me. Um, and that is the, the 50th Indian Tank Brigade, which was deployed in the Arakan after it had uh, been deployed in Kohima, etc. And it fought in all the main actions down in the Arakan. 
And there's two people, well, three actually, I shall mention, um, but two, Archie Gwatkin and his brother, uh, sorry, and his colleague, John Skinner. Um, now, the Gwatkins, the father was a major general in the Indian Army. He was a cavalry, cavalry man. Uh, he was approaching retirement. And Archie and his brother, Freddie, both joined Indian cavalry regiments, the same ones that his father had been involved in. Um, and Archie and John Skinner were very close friends. And they both were deployed as Ford tank officers uh, in the Arakan. This is a picture of Major General Gwatkin in the middle with Archie, the taller one on the left, and Freddie on the right. Now, the significance is, is, is this is where they are today. They were both killed on exactly the same day in March 1945 in completely different parts of Burma. Freddie was killed in Mactila, and Archie was killed in uh, the Arakan. Um, a shell exploded, and, and, and Archie was seriously injured and died later. Just next to Archie is the grave of his very good friend, John Skinner. And as I said, I, I came across them at Taishan. I didn't fully understand this story. Um, their nephew has been very kind and supportive in providing me a lot of information. But I just bring it in to add a personal context. You know, these were the men who fought in the tanks. And here's two brothers side by side. Um, and Major General Gotkin lost his only two sons. He had a daughter who survived, but um, he lost his two sons on exactly the same day in Burma. You at least know we're at the end, and these are just my humble conclusions. Um, and I appreciate that people may have a different opinion. Um, but my view and my contention is that Armour played a significant role in the campaigns fought in Burma, Northeast India. And the role is often neglected and perhaps sometimes not understood. Um, but new techniques were developed. You know, they learnt quickly. Um, once they had the tank, which was obsolete elsewhere, it was perfect for use in Burma. And the use of the all arms battle groups, which is now very much the, the mantra, um, was developed in Burma just as effectively as it was in Northwest Europe. Of course, you've got to think about the role of the Royal Engineers, the Indian electrical and mechanical engineers, who obviously looked after all the tanks and the armament, the Royal Indian Army Service Corps, the Indian Army. Ordnance Corps, all these other people who so often overlooked, but without them, the tanks would never have been able to move, let alone fight. And I hope, and I think I'm preaching to the converted here, but one of the things that uh, does upset me a little bit sometimes is that to some people in popular culture, you know, the Second World War is Dunkirk, D-Day, Arnhem and Bomber Command. And, you know, to me, the role of the campaigns in Burma and the role of the armour is, is absolutely crucial. Anyway, I hope that you've uh, found the presentation uh, informative. Uh, I'm sorry if I've had to gallop through quite quickly. Um, as I said, time doesn't permit me to go into much more detail, but I have put a couple of documents onto my website, which you can download free of charge. One is a history of the 50th Indian Tank Brigade, and one is a biography of the Gwatkin family uh, and their three generations of service to the British Crown and the British Indian Army. Um, but with that, thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. And I shall now step back and pass over to Sylvia or Rob. Well, you hand over to me, Rob. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I, what I haven't told everyone, I was rather hoping that you'd make it through tonight and you have. Dear old Rob has been suffering for the last week with COVID, and it's been touch and go this week as to whether or not he'd be able to, um, to give this presentation tonight. Um, thank you very much indeed. That was, that was fabulous, and it's given us a really good introduction to a, a forgotten element, I think, of the campaign. 
Uh, and I'm not going to add a huge amount more, apart from just to answer a couple of questions that people have raised and to say a few things myself about armor. Um, the first thing is that Steve Rothwell quite rightly has made mention. Steve is with us tonight. Thank you very much indeed. If you don't know Steve, uh, you need to get to know Steve if you're interested in the Burma campaign. He's, Burma campaign. he's a little bit like Rob. He's a little bit of a, a mine of information. He's got a website called rothwell.force9.co.uk. Um, do have a look at that, and it's full of amazing stuff. And uh, thank you very much, Steve. Steve's made the point that the late Brian Parrott, the wonderful late Brian Parrott, uh, wrote a fabulous book called Tank Tracks to Rangoon. It's recently been republished by Pen and Sword, and it's worth reading. Uh, he's a very good writer, Brian, and it tells a great story of the development of tanks. The one thing that I would say about tanks is that, well, I'll say two things. One is that it gave the infantry uh, mobile pillboxes. Uh, for destroying the primary problem that the Japanese posed uh, when they were in the defensive, which was their bunker. We saw that at Kahima, we saw it in Northern Arakan at Sinswea and the, the Mayo range in 1944. And we saw it actually throughout 1945 in Burma itself. So it's a very, very important uh, new tactic, new, new capability added to the infantry, which made the infantry's life much, much easier. It took quite some time for British commanders really to understand the capability that they had in terms of the 25th, uh, 25th Dragoons in Arakan. But once they understood that, then they utilized it uh, quite extensively. But the second thing it did is that tanks gave co um, commanders like Slim the ability to use oper or to deploy operational maneuver, that is to move their forces far and fast in a very well protected way with the ability to, to fight as well, quite, quite significant. Um, Rob Crane has asked the question about, was there any tank on tank action? Yes, there was a little bit of tank on tank action in 1942. It wasn't particularly significant. I think the, the major tank battle, if we can call it that, was in the, um, the middle of March 1944, when a Japanese tank force uh, as part of Operation Ugo, which is invasion of India, was moving up against Moray, uh, north of Tamu, and it engaged um, uh, tanks of the Royal Armoured Corps and were, uh, were soundly routed, but that's really the only tank on tank battle in, in Burma. Uh, I noticed John Hinchcliffe, lovely John, is on um, the, uh, the webinar tonight. Uh, John for many years uh, ran um, Orient Express in Burma, and he and I, uh, with you remember John, uh, with Major John Childs, um, went to Niengu in 2005, and then we followed the route of Provence Horse. John Charles was a young officer in Provence Horse at the time. They were equipped with Shermans, and they moved on to Mechtila. And that was an amazing experience, um, going through Burmese villages that hadn't seen um, foreigners for a very, very long time. But being able to talk with John about the experience of serving in an Indian armored regiment, fighting against the Japanese uh, Provence Horse, what an extraordinary experience that was. Um, and I, John's also mentioned Chegwin, um, and of course Rob has mentioned Chegwin as well. Chegwin is on the uh, the eastern side of the Chindwin um, at uh, Kalemnyo. It's basically the end of the road as you move up from Moniwa, and it's the point at which uh, basically all of the British armour had to stay and rot uh, during the retreat. Uh, one tank, as, as Rob has said, managed to get back into India, the curse of Scotland. Right, that's enough from me. Um, thank you very much, Rob. I'm just going to have a quick look at, at the questions. Um, well, Alan has asked the question, how was the availability of armour select for Burma campaign? Well, in 1942, uh, the 7th Armoured Brigade uh, managed to arrive in Rangoon um, Propitiously, fortunately, because um, just as, as um, the Japanese were about to reach Rangoon, and they were crucial to the defense of, uh, to, to the ability of the Burma Corps to actually get back to, to India. Uh, there was no choice made uh, about that. They were the only tanks available, but those the M3 Stuarts, uh, and I agree with one of the comments that it was a fabulous tank, actually ideally suited to Burma, actually. Um, 25th Dragoons uh, was a, as um, as Rob has said, were the, the opportunity was given to uh, GHQ India to have a squadron of Lee Grant. There are many people in Delhi who said they weren't, it wasn't worth it. You know, tanks were of no value in the the arm um, uh, in India. 
Uh, Frank uh, Maservi disagreed and a number of others disagreed as well. And fortunately, under uh, conditions of great secrecy, the 25th Dragoons were taken into, um, uh, into the northern part of uh, Arakan um, in uh, late 1943 from Calcutta and early 1944 and proved their worth in uh, those very significant battles. Um, Yes, the, the, the point from Rob Crane, and uh, Rob has already mentioned this. Actually, the the, the issue with the Valentine tanks in um, at Don Bike, a uh, very sad story. It wasn't just the, the tanks that were misused; infantry were misused as well, and um, there was a lack of comprehension about how best to defeat the bunker. And what we saw at Don Bike was repeated uh, attacks of a some type quality against very fixed and immovable Japanese defense. It's quite an intelligent Japanese defense. But um, otherwise, I mean, I suggest that the Valentines used properly would have been quite effective. Um, and Slim always thought so in Defeat into Victory. He makes the point that actually they, it, it wasn't the tank that was uh, on bike, it was the way they were misused. Right, uh, let's just have a look to see whether there are any other questions. I don't think there are, by all means, um, put something in chat. And if we haven't answered it tonight, then um, we're very happy to uh, email responses back to people. And the good news is that um, Rob's presentation will be uh, on the KET website. Thank you, Rob, for that. And Rob has also written a really good summary of um, armor in the Burma campaign, which is, as he suggested, is also available from his website. So do go and have a look at that and have a good route around his website. It's full of some real gems as well. I see another question has popped up. Well, um, it's a very good question from Dave, Dave Current. Um, well, I just wanted to, I was going to say earlier that you saw those um, Lee Grants Oh, sorry, those Shermans on that dusty track, they're actually moving to Mactila as part of the uh, the Proven's Horse, Proven Horses advance to, to Mactila. Uh, and from that point, all of the fuel for the tanks came by air. It's quite an extraordinary thing to relate, but from Mactila all the way down to Rangoon on um, the 2nd or 3rd of May 1945, 90% uh, of all the combat supplies for the 14th Army came by air, including the fuel. So everything was rationed. And one of the reasons why uh, you see the troops sitting on tanks is because a number, uh, quite a large number of the trucks were just left by the roadside because there wasn't fuel from them for them. They were all, all the fuel was dedicated to the tanks. It was uh, slim called it um, sea or bust. And uh, fuel was, it was an extraordinarily important part of, um, uh, of that maneuver. And, uh, and the troops went on half rations for two and a half months as well, in order to be able to enable those C-47s above them, which only took two and a half tons of um, in their holds, uh, the opportunity to take as much fuel, fuel as you can. There's some hair-raising stories of C-47s landing at Mactila with um, just packed full of 44-gallon um, uh, drums of, uh, of fuel. I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't worth thinking about what would have happened were there to be a, a naked flame um, and uh, we could go on for quite a long time. There's a very good question about um, Australian um, expertise um, as well that's been raised, and not so much in terms of armoured warfare. The Australians, of course, use Matilda tanks extensively in New Guinea and very, very successfully. Um, the same things, I think, well, the first point to say is that the Australian experience in New Guinea, which is about six to eight months ahead of what the Indian Army was experiencing in India and Burma was very, very important to the Indian Army and to the, the British Army. And um, it's very significant lessons were learned. And, and tanks were used for the same purpose in New Guinea uh, as they were, as Rob's described, in, at Kahima and, uh, and, and the Sintwea Arakan in 1944, slightly differently than in 1945, because we then saw quite large scale operational maneuver for the first time. But in, in um, 1944, at Sintwea, the admin box, and Kahima, they were used as bunker busters very, very effectively. The same use that the Australians put their Matildas. Right. I think that's probably uh, all the questions that we've had. And it's probably time for me to hand over to Sylvia. 
Well, thank you to you both. And it was a brilliant account of uh, the effectiveness of tanks and armoured cars, Rob. Thank you so much. It, particularly interesting to me and my husband, as we were fortunate enough to meet Ezra Rhodes some years back. And of course, the tank that lies in Kahima is a must-see for every time you go there. And it was, in fact, our friends in our sister organisation, the Kahima Educational Society, who made and erected the stones that sit beside the tank telling Ezra's story. Well, as always, the Trust is pleased to bring you this series of webinars, and I would like to thank everyone who has made such a terrific contribution this past year, offering so much of their free time and effort to make the series this successful. I know many of you are listening this evening, and your continued support means a great deal. Already, we have a wonderful programme for next year, starting on 19th of January, when Rob Lyman will be with George Wilton talking about 23 Brigade. But we have one more to come this year with a difference. Next Thursday on the 1st of December, we will be holding a virtual service of remembrance and commemoration when Bishop Nigel Stock will lead us through a service of readings, music, poetry and prayer. We will start at our usual time of 8pm and do hope that you will be able to join us. Meanwhile, if you have yet to purchase your Christmas cards, you may like to consider buying our Naga cards, handmade in Naga homes. The designs are new this year and selling very quickly. And if you would like some ideas for original Christmas gifts, we also have lots of Naga jewellery available on our online store. Bags, scarves, all made in Nagaland. All profits from every sale goes directly to our work in Nagaland. And of course, all of Rob Lyman's books are also available here. And with thanks to the generous discounts from publishers, all proceeds can also go to the work of the Trust. So thank you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate all your support and your feedback is always extremely helpful. Keep it coming. We hope to see you next Thursday and wish you a good evening in the meantime. Good night. <laughs>